But thank you so much for the opportunity to, to honestly devote a, um, an hour and a half of our week to be with your people so that we can be together. We're grateful for Zion. We're grateful that as your people gather, uh, we can encourage one another and we can hold each other accountable. I pray, even for those of us in the room who don't know each other well, I pray we'd find little pockets in our own little clique within this body that we would be able to grow in. Um, I pray, God, now uh, at this moment that you would uh, illuminate the text for us. We're coming with our own ideas and thoughts about what we want you to be, but I do pray you'd meet us here and, and make it clear uh, exactly who you are. So grow us in our faith according to Romans 10, 17. Use it as a discerner of our innermost thoughts according to Hebrews 4, 12. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna explain some stuff. It's two different parts, the sign of Jonah section and then this uh, 11 section, but we are in chapter 16. Okay, so if you're new, just understand, we have over the, you know, a little over a year, about a year and like four months, we talked about the last 15 chapters of Matthew. So if you're coming in, you're like, what is he randomly talking about? Well, he's not randomly talking about anything. We're just slowly going through the, the, the book of Matthew. Chapter 16, verse one. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test him, that's Jesus, and they asked him to show them a, and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now there's a problem with this request because well, if you weren't with us last week, he just healed the blind, the deaf, the mute, cast out demons, and now they're asking for a sign, which we actually saw a lot of this, which I'll explain here in a little bit uh, before, but it is from an evil place, which you'll get, we'll get to here in a second. So they asked Jesus, show us a sign. Verse two, and he answered them, when it is evening, you say it'll be fair weather, the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Now, we actually have a, what's called a textual variant here for the Bible nerds in the house. Some codexes don't mention uh, verses two uh, and part of three in these codexes. So uh, if you have a certain translation, a really good study Bible, it's gonna say at the bottom there, certain codexes don't have this, what's called a textual variant. I just want you to be aware of that. I think it does belong uh, for multiple reasons, which I won't get into right now. Long story short, the text is saying, essentially, you can look out at the sky before you go to bed at night and you go, man, it's, it's cloudy. Not just kind of clouds, but like dark clouds. It might rain tonight. You, you can discern that idea, but what you can't do, and this is what he's talking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, is you can't interpret the signs of the times. Meaning he's telling them in this moment, God's doing something in front of you, just like you'd be able to look at the sky and see what, but you can't see that God's doing something in front of you right now. You can't interpret this. Um, I will say, and, and I'll come back to this idea but interpreting the signs of our times could be like a, a whole Sunday, maybe a whole year in of itself. I think there's a sense, a little bit for us as believers, um, and I know the cessationists in the house don't love this, but to pray into and ask God to reveal what he's doing in these certain periods of time is really important for us to ask, to see and be wise in moments, but I'm not gonna go into that. It's not what the text is about here. Uh, so he, he calls them out on this, and he goes on to say what he said uh, before, um, uh, verse uh, four, he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks, a sign, seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Now we've already talked about this. We actually devoted an entire Sunday uh, back in November to what the sign of Jonah is, all right? So there's a few parts of this. If you were with us at that time, just give me like 60 seconds, two minutes to catch everyone else up. You can check out for a minute. It says, an evil and adulterous generation seek a sign. He associates uh, this idea of adultery to these religious leaders, which he does a ton in the Old Testament. Isaiah 50, Jeremiah uh, 3, 31, Ezekiel 16, uh, the whole book of Hosea. He associates the way that you think of adultery. You're, you're uh, cheating on God. That's what you're doing. He calls this generation, which they are kind of the uh, linchpin for all of this. Um, and he says, you're seeking this sign, which signs would honestly be used a lot in the Old Testament. They're asking for a sign because Moses gave them a sign and Elijah gave them a sign, right? God has used people to give signs to prove that they are of God. So that's not that out of the ordinary, but Jesus' response is no sign's gonna be given to you except the sign of the prophet of Jonah. Now we saw this again back in Matthew chapter 11 in November, and, and I'll just be real brief. What he's saying here is even though you saw these healings, um, I'm only gonna give you one sign, and it's the sign of the resurrection. And you can either be like the people of Nineveh and repent for your sins because uh, this prophet has been spewed out of the fish, right? And, and it has rose from the dead, or you can continue to be hard-hearted. That's what we talked about in Matthew chapter 11. And in the end, I, I want you to hear the tone of this um, because when you read this, you go, okay, so he's just kind of having this interaction what you might be missing, though, is there's an aggravation in Jesus' voice. As a matter of fact, let me show you this. You can turn there if you want. But in Mark chapter 8, this entire encounter, which I'll reference two other times besides this, 
This entire counter is told from another perspective in Mark 8. So we have Matthew 16 here. In Mark 8, the same encounter is going on. I want you to notice this. Here's what happens when he says this. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. So this is the same exact moment, but from Mark's perspective. Now notice what Mark adds here at the beginning of verse 12 of chapter 8. And he, being Jesus, sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation, uh, generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Now I want you to notice just the part, verse 12 in there. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, he, um, uh, he's, he's tired. I mean, this is, if you're tired of hearing how much the Pharisees and the Sadducees are arguing with Jesus, Jesus is tired of arguing with the Sadducees, uh, the Sadducees, okay, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He's tired. He's, he's, he's exhausted with all this. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Kent Hughes, he commented on this and he says, this would be in Mark 12, this word that's used. Um, it's used intensely, intensively, indicated strong despair or dismay or grief or indignation or perhaps even a deep pain that the Pharisees would not believe him. I'm about to date myself, but I gotta say this. When I think of what Jesus is feeling right here, I'm thinking of Patrick Swayze ghost, okay? I know, I know, like half our church is like, what's happening right now? But listen, there's this, this movie where this dude dies and he wants to communicate to the living. I'm not saying it's biblical. I'm just saying it's a movie. And the only way he can communicate with, um, uh, with the living is like all of his emotion, everything within him has to be gathered up and he can like move a bottle cap, right? And so I think this, what's going on within Jesus is when he sighs with despair, it's like you guys are never, it doesn't matter. You're only gonna come to God on your terms. This just is never gonna happen. You, you and I do this too. We expect like God's an auctioneer in the sky. Okay, I'll give you this. If I give you this, what if I do this? What if I do? That's not how it works. There's a sense that heaven sighs at this and goes, it's just never going to be enough. It doesn't matter what I do. You'll never believe on my terms. And so there's a sighing and a despair that Jesus is feeling here. And, and honestly, appropriately so, um, there, there's a frustration that should be had. Well, let's go on to this next section. He goes in verse five. When the disciples reached out to the other side, reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring uh, any bread. And now Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began discussing uh, it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, oh, you have little faith. Why are you discussing among yourself the fact that you have no bread? I love the disciples. I know sometimes, uh, you know, it's always accused the disciples change the story. Ain't nobody changing the story to just make yourself look like an idiot over and over and over again. And this encounter, uh, we just got done talking about feeding a 5,000, just last week, feeding a 4,000. They're on their way, and the disciples are like, oh, we forgot bread. <clears throat> Jesus starts to talk about this leaven of the Pharisees, and they're going, yeah, we forgot bread. And he's going, what, what are you talking about right now? And if anybody should not be afraid of not having bread, it would be the disciples of Jesus. If there's anybody who's like a monopoly on the bread industry, it's Jesus. I mean, the, the, the intake is free. He has the power of God to just produce it. And so they're, go, they're worried about it. He's like, You're just missing it. And Jesus does what he always does. He takes things that are very simple and he makes this beautiful uh, understanding out of these analogies. It goes on to say this. Do you yet not perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves? We actually quoted this from Mark last week. For the 5,000 and the many baskets you gathered. Or the seven loaves uh, for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered. How is it that you fail to understand that I do not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Oh, I mean, if you look at the text, you can see, follow it all the way from five to 12. Disciples talk about bread. Jesus talks about the leaven of the Pharisees. Disciples bring bread back up. Jesus goes back to the leaven of the Pharisees. The disciples are like, what's going on? Jesus goes on this whole deal. And then finally they go, oh, I get it. He's not talking about bread. He's talking about the, the leaven of the Pharisees. Um, the statement here I want you to look at where we're gonna spend most of our time appears in verse six and then in verse 11, okay? So um, I want to kind of shift and just acknowledge that the point of, of this section here is a warning from Jesus about the leaven of the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of that time. And um, it's tricky because we just talked about literally 
three weeks ago, man-made traditions, um, we just talked about what I would consider the leaven of the Pharisees. As a matter of fact, we will spend three weeks in uh, Matthew 23 talking about the issue with the Pharisees. Um, and so I want to do something a, a, a little bit different. For clarity, and you don't have to turn there if you don't want, but if you're somebody who marks in your Bible, uh, you can actually write down Luke chapter 12, uh, uh, verse 1, because He's telling them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And I just want to be clear. The leaven of the, the Pharisees, as it says in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, okay? So there is that. There is that. Now, let me just catch this up real quick, okay? We talked about leaven uh, when we talked about in Matthew 13. So there's all these things that are going back that we, we've already had this conversation on. And it was actually in a good tone. If you remember this, it was the leaven of the kingdom of God growing. I don't know if you guys remember that, but um, it was It was good. Here's the, the tricky part of it. Uh, again, if you remember all this, just check out. Let me catch everybody up in about 60 seconds. Leaven is this, uh, it's like yeast, this little thing that goes in dough and it grows. My wife makes pizza every single Friday night. Last uh, Saturday, we did Tough Mudder. So she made the dough and then she's like, oh, I don't have time to make the pizza. So she tried to put it in Tupperware. Um, but I don't, when it started to rise, there ain't no stopping. It just busted through the Tupperware and spewed all over the refrigerator um, because that's what happens. It continues to grow and grow and grow and grow, which is great. But, but here's what the Pharisees, are going to hear, or at least a first century Jew, the disciples are going to hear when he tells them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Um, if you're not aware of this, in Exodus chapter 12, Jews today celebrate uh, what took place in that chapter. Uh, it's called the Passover, and, and the seven days after the Passover is the seven days of uh, the feast of the, the unleavened bread. What happens even today in Jewish homes is um, a parents will send out the night before the Passover, send out the kids all over the house, and they're to do this weird kind of you know uh, hide and seek thing where they're supposed to find yeast, any yeast in the home, because the idea is yeast is a symbol for Jews of sin. Now, obviously, it's not sinful to eat, but it's this symbol that goes remove all the yeast from your home. And so they go out and they go start searching, looking at crackers. I don't know, it's just a weird thing, right? My, my best friend growing up was Jewish and he would tell me about this thing. I'm like, well, I don't know what you're doing right now. My parents are doing dope. I don't know what to tell you, okay? <laughs> okay, all right. It's 8 a.m., relax, okay? True story though, I'm not lying. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so like it's weird, right? So you, you have this thing where, where they're thinking of, when they hear leaven, they're thinking of uh, the Passover. That's, that's what they're thinking of. There's no question. Like if I do this in our modern culture, I go, hey, let's get together once a year as a family, sit around the table and eat turkey and mashed potatoes. You immediately think of Thanksgiving. Right? The first century Jew is not going to be thinking of Thanksgiving in the same way you're not thinking of Passover when you hear leaven. But that's what they're thinking of. Now, that being said, Jesus is not using it in a positive way. He's using it in a negative way in the same way it needs to be cast out from Exodus 12. So this is kind of the understanding of leaven. And he's going to say, I want you to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, again, the point is the fact that he's going to be addressing hypocrisy, which we're going to spend three weeks on in Matthew 23. I want to do something a little bit different, okay? Uh, if I could be so bold. Um, I was talking with somebody this week, and I realized, or, or uh, it became uh, apparent, that this guy that I was talking to clearly has been reading Spurgeon, okay? And here's how I knew he had been reading Spurgeon. When he was talking about reading Spurgeon, he described him perfectly. He says, he comes across as topically exegetical. Now, those are fancy words if you're new to church. But what that means is what we're doing right now is exegesis. We're just going through the Bible verse by verse, and we're breaking it down. Spurgeon's kind of weird, though, you guys. And, I, and you know how much I love Spurgeon. What he does is he sometimes only takes one verse or a part of a verse and then he just melees you with all this stuff. And so though it is exegetical, he's going through it, he'll spend three weeks on Jesus wept. As a matter of, he's got three sermons on Jesus wept from John 15, so you're kind of, or John 11, right, 11.35. So like the idea here is uh, when, when Spurgeon breaks down a text, he kind of goes on to this idea. Um, I, wanted, I wanna kind of do that for us today, and here's why. Because we've already talked somewhat about the leaven of the Pharisees in particular, meaning look at the, look at the text, if, if you could. I want you to see, it says, the leaven of the Pharisees. I want you to notice, if you just slow down, notice that the Pharisees is the adjective. If you don't remember school, an adjective is a word of description. If I would say that's a cool building or that's a big ball, right? If I say those things, uh, cool and big, those are adjectives. It's describing something, English class. You get it, right? The leaven here, though, I want you to notice this. The leaven is the issue. Now, it's the leaven of the Pharisees. That, that's the descriptive word there. 
But, but the leaven is issue. And just in case you think I'm crazy, you could turn to Mark chapter eight. I want you to look at verse 15. I got it on the screen. Jesus, in the same time where he's talking about the leaven of the Pharisees, I want you to see what he adds. He talks about this. This is what he says. And he continued, uh, um, and he, or I'm sorry, and he cautioned them saying, watch out. So this is the same exact moment in time. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And notice what he says next. And the leaven of Herod. Notice, so, so here's what I'll say. The leaven of the Pharisees is the issue of that moment. That is the issue, what the disciples need to worry about. And we're gonna talk about that at length. I actually wanna lay the foundation and say, before we get to the leaven of the Pharisees, can we just talk about leaven? I, I wanna talk about the issue of leaven. Beware of leaven. Beware of leaven. Now, obviously, I don't mean this literally, but there's something that Jesus is getting at from the leaven of the Pharisees, who are religious hypocrites, to the leaven of Herod, who's a hedonist, and everything in between. Beware of leaven. Now, what did I say leaven was? What do we understand leaven? Leaven is this small thing that enters into the dough or whatever it is, yeast and it makes it rise, and it starts small, but it consumes the sugar in there, it consumes what is giving it life in there, so it knots a mold in there, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And if you're not careful, if you're not, if, if you're not aware of what's going on, if you, you don't uh, heed this caution to beware, then it's gonna grow and it's gonna take it over. And so here's how um, I feel like I, I wanna approach this. When I hear Jesus giving uh, this caution, this word of caution, uh, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And if we're just to go, okay, we'll get to the leaven of the Pharisees. Can we just talk about being aware of the leaven? I hear the booming voice of God of the Old Testament. And this is actually why I want to focus on this. The reason I want to lay this foundation is because it was really hard for me not to hear the God of the Old Testament, which Jesus is, um, and not hear the continued echo of, of what the Old Testament about is this warning constantly. The, the, the leaven is, is tricky as, as God tells Adam, beware, you think that you can be like me. Beware of that leaven because it's gonna grow into that bite. And it, beware, Cain, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to overtake you. Beware that jealousy, the leaven of jealousy is gonna grow to you murdering. Beware of that leaven. Beware as he saves his people from Egypt. Beware of this leaven constantly desiring to go back to Egypt. There are ways and traditions in that small part we see this. And this is what the Old Testament is about. As a matter of fact, again and again in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, um, uh, uh, parts of Deuteronomy. Where else it mentions it? Somewhere else. 1 Kings, 2 Kings. What's the other two? 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. Chronicles. Thank you. 1 and 2 Chronicles. In all of those passages, you're going to see this statement happen a lot. There was a breach of faith in the camp of Israel. Now that imagery is perfect for us in those books because I want you to imagine a camp and there's a breach in the wall. And if you're not careful, you don't repair that wall quickly. What seemingly is, is nothing, it's not a big deal. They took one of the false gods. It's not that huge of a deal. It is a big deal. And God keeps warning the people, don't be like the Philistines. Don't be like the Canaanites. Don't be like the Amorites because the leaven of their ways of life could slowly seep in. Now you may not believe me. Let me quote uh, the Old Testament to you. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, Verse nine, it says this, when you come into the land, so God has been promising that Israel, who uh, is to overcome the, the, the Canaanites, uh, when they come into the promised land that was all, promised all the way back to Abraham, this is what he's gonna say. When you come into the land, the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. Okay, why? why? That's not a big deal if you, you kind of do a little bit this way. The, no, no, no. There shall, be no fa there shall be not found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a, so or a sorcerer uh, on, or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Now you may go, that's a weird list. Okay, that's not bad. That's not a big deal. That's, that's a random list. Here's the problem. Everything that he just described that we're missing in the context here is, that is what they were doing. This is what the nation was doing. And so now you're amongst the nations. And so you go, that's not that crazy. And so let me give you a prime example of this. Let me tell you what ain't allowed in the Myers household. You will not find no Ouija board, right? Okay. Now you can go, oh, it's just a stupid board. Uh, maybe, but probably not. Okay. Because here's the deal, like this is what, this is a, a very occult type idea that's going, it's not that big of a deal, they're just up there messing around. No, they're not. 
No, they're not. Now, this is that, that analogy is painting specifically for them. The people of Israel, slowly but surely, as they are rescued from Egypt, they got the law and they learned the ways of the Lord, slowly gravitated. It's called in the book of Judges, they were being Canaanized. They were learning to be Canaanized. And, and what we see, the devil's tactic is generational change. And so what seems extreme to us based on the Puritans was not crazy to the Puritans, but it just took us 400 years for it to seem crazy. That slowly the ways of the world seep in like leaven. And if we're not careful, if we do not, we're not uh, aware of the leaven, we will continue to see this happen. And this is, of course, what goes on uh, with, with the God of the Old Testament as he goes on to say in Deuteronomy 18, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess. Can you hear that? I love that. You, you are, he, these nations, these ways, you're about to dispossess them. You're to separate from them. Legit language there. Listen to, for, um, listen to fortune tellers and uh, uh, to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Listen, the leaven that's super intoxicating in the age in which we live and has been the age of all of mankind. It's super simple, uh, comfortable to go, maybe God's ways, his thoughts, his ideas, his philosophies, what he understands, what he wants for my life, maybe it's not right. And what starts as a simple idea, that, that simple yeast, as it grows in your mind and it grows in your faith, God slowly gets pushed to the side. Beware of leaven. Beware of leaven, okay? Now, that being said, I wanna to try to make this practical. At a large level, I wanna make it practical, but I also wanna make it practical at a, um, an, an, an individual level. And so I made a list for us. Um, I made a list at a large level to say, okay, if, if I was, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is like I'm some prophet or anything at all, but if I was to discern the times in which we live, okay? If I was to go, and I can see the times in which we live, and we would look at the, what, what I hold to replacement theology, so it's simple for me to say this, but I would say that Zion or the people of God, right? Where we exist right now as the church, I wanna just put in front of you why we need to be aware of this. Because check this out. He's not saying beware of the cooked loaf of bread. That's not what he's saying. Like leaven is tiny. It starts small and it grew. And as it's grown, we actually see in the church fully cooked loaves of bread. But, but we, we didn't call it out early enough. And so let, let, me, let me just uh, bring some of these things up. This is not shade or shots at anyone, but I just wanna be clear on, on what this looks like. If we were to interpret the signs, what we can see in the church right now, uh, the leaven of this world slowly intaking itself into the church. I say this with as much grace as possible, but hopefully you'll see what I'm saying. I think we've seen the leaven of charisma, eloquent speech, popularity, instead of the purity of the lowly path and the daily cross lifting. In celebrity pastors and seeker sensitive churches, we've seen we like certain people because uh, they are gifted and not because they are faithful. The leaven of comfort has rocked us asleep instead of the purity of Matthew 16 to deny, to follow, and to lose your life. The leaven of individualism has grown into the church to the point where, where I'm telling you, as leaders and elders and staff and deacons, we hear more about what this church can offer me instead of 1 Peter 2 being true, 1 Corinthians 12, the purity of 1 Corinthians 12, that we as a body should be members and belong to one another. But individualism, the leaven of individualism has found itself. And so we have churches placating, hoping, pleading with the masses to enter into the doors and going, no, 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 there's a high standard. If you wanna to belong to Pella, the reality is you need to be a member and you need to get involved. You coming on Sunday, this isn't a movie theater. I'm not here to entertain you like some jester. No, no, we're gonna look at the word and it's gonna call us out. The, the, the leaven of political parties being our hope instead of the purity of the kingdom, our kingdom not being of this world. The leaven of trusting our own power instead of the purity of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that in weakness strength is found. The leaven of human philosophy defining our sexuality instead of the purity of God's word giving us direction on how to use our bodies. The leaven, the leaven, the leaven, the leaven. Just look at the church and you can see like within your spirit as you read the word of God and go, that's not right. There's something wrong there. And, and listen, it didn't just like wake up one day and be that way. But slowly but surely, we, we through leaven, it grew. It grew. Now, um, that's out there, though. That's great. Um, how do we not um, just look at the forest, though, and how do we look at the trees? 
How do we see this within like our own heart? And I have a small list. I'm sure there's other things, but it's really hard to not think of John 17, 16, that um, uh, they are not of this world in the same way I am not of this world. And when we think of as individuals and as a community, as we address the community issues, we think of individuals, this is true. And I, I wanna give you just a short list of ways I've watched people in my own life, okay? I've watched leaven of something, even a good thing, grow into something where they're no longer believers today. And I think some of you have as well. Like, like, and I don't mean just big lofty polytheism, uh, uh, pantheism, deism, open theism. I mean, seemingly good things that grew into big things for them to go either I don't need God anymore or I'm frustrated. I don't like that God said this. I've seen this happen. And so I want us to be aware of the leaven uh, uh, of this age. A list, the list, and again, this is definitely not even extensive, but I've watched this. I've watched the leaven of money. I've watched the leaven of wanting a spouse. So bad. I've, I've watched people want a spouse so bad that they would marry a non-believer and eventually leave the faith. That's how bad that leaven grew within them. It started off as something simple and beautiful. And you should desire to have a spouse. I want you to have a spouse. I want to play matchmaker all day long, okay? <laughs> the leaven even of theology. I've watched the leaven of treat yourself, the leaven of laziness, the leaven of you first. I've seen all these, these leavens grow and it's something that uh, your Christianity became about you and then eventually, inevitably, you didn't need it. And, and how I saw this is interesting. There's a guy named uh, Ralph Hulk. Uh, some of you guys know who he is. He was a, a manager for the Yankees in the early 60s. I was not alive in the early 60s, okay? Um, but I remember hearing this story about how Ralph uh, Hulk in the early 60s, he, uh, he, he helped his players get through the season. Uh, and I don't know much about baseball, and to be honest with you, I don't really like baseball. But um, I remember hearing this and thought it was uh, pretty brilliant. What he would do is the schedule is more strenuous than it is now. There's like this now in baseball, there's like 700 games in a season. It's ridiculous, like eight hours long. But, but um, they would have like double headers three or four times a week in the early 60s. Inevitably, you'd get a player who would come up and say, hey, Skip, can I take this game off? Now, um, he was like brilliant. Ralph Hawk was, was, was smart and he would go, totally get it. Man, you, you're on the grind. That's fine. Listen, do me a favor. Play the first inning because you're in the starting lineup and then I'll let you skip the whole game, right? And he knew something. He knew that the, the moment they got into the game, and this would inevitably happen, they'd get in the game, they'd get caught up in the competition and the fun of the game, they'd finish the game. They would just do that. And this is, this, is, this is what I mean. There are things right now that I'm listing for you that you'd go, I don't want it. I don't want anything to do with it. And it's just like, hey, just play the first inning. Just do that. And can you see the leaven? It's not that big of a deal. You got the gram. You're not looking at porn necessarily. Technically, you're not there. Beware of the leaven. You see that? Oh, everybody else is getting married. I really, beware of the leaven. Okay, like, and, and I've even seen this. What's fascinating is I've seen poor people are more enamored with money than rich people are. And so it's the fact that slowly but surely you build your life around this. And so God calls this out again and again and again. Just play the first inning, but then you get caught up, don't you? Wow, this is fun. Beware of the leaven. Beware of the leaven. It grows. I would uh, remind you of Colossians chapter two, verse eight, that says this, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world and not according to Christ. Now just let that sit for a second. I know sometimes I'll read verses on a Sunday. It's like, oh, that's great. But like, just meditate on that with me for a second. Like there are people, there are ideas that are seeking to take you captive. Can you see that? Listen, it's not just like physical chains. Do you understand? There is very real beings and entities with very real ideas and philosophies that are trying to take you captive to something other than Christ. You see that? So, so you just being passive thinking you're gonna drift towards Christ is not the case because there's some other side pulling you. This is why it's, it's not a coincidence that in the next chapter, chapter three, verse one, many of you know this in verses one and two, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things uh, that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I remind you of James chapter one, verse 27, to keep yourself unspotted from the world. First Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, 
Romans chapter 12, verse 2. How many of you know this? To not be conformed to the patterns of this world. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. So it's not just philosophies and ideologies pulling you this way. They've gone to war, but you haven't. And that's how leaven slowly grows. You're not aware? No, no, clean it. Keep a clean slate. Keep a clean slate. Keep a clean slate. In the camp of God, let there be no breach of faith. May that be true, not just in your own life, but what's crazy is in 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the idea of leaven entering into the household of God, saying, cast that leaven, that person out from among you. So even as a community of faith, our role as elders, one of our roles as elders, as gatekeepers, is to look at the faith and go, listen, that's not happening here. We're never gonna be cool with your sin. That's never gonna happen. Now listen, you're fighting it all day, welcome. Bring it in, bring it in all day, we're fighting it but you're cool with it, we ain't cool with it. You understand? The camp itself, the people of God in this small little church that will be forgotten in 100 years in public communities, it matters for us to beware of leaven, of small things. It's not just our responsibility though, it's your responsibility as well. To call each other out, to be in each other's life and to do this well. Now, I'd be a fool to bring up Spurgeon earlier but not quote him at the end. So let's do it. Here's what he says. With much affection, I press these considerations upon you, for I have pressed them upon my own hearts. I fear we shall not enjoy the blessing that we have had as a church unless there is, a more, unless there is more jealousy for holiness among us. I am, I am afraid, listen to this line, I'm afraid that some of us are barren of spiritual usefulness because we do not watch against sin. Oh, keep your conscience tender. Beware of getting it seared. Keep your heart tender before God, ready to be moved by the faintest breath of the Spirit. Ask to be like a sensitive plant that you may shrivel up at the touch of sin and only open uh, open out in the presence of your Lord and Master. uh, God grant it to you. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that as we come to you, you would hear us even though our lives are full of opportunities for leaven to grow. We continue to um, sit at your table and yet um, go sit with the dogs. We continue to, with one hand, worship you on Sunday and yet with the other hand, click all the things we shouldn't click. And God, I pray Um, that you would show us how that little bit of leaven, make it real as it grows, um, not just within our own hearts, but within the church, how detrimental it is. I pray, Jesus, as we explore the leaven of Herod and the leaven of Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, I pray, God, that you would show us even religious things uh, can become this leaven. I pray, God, that we would um, be honest before you. We would be real before you with our sin. We would confess our sin and keep short accounts. Holy Spirit, more than anything, keep us aware of the leaven. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.